Okay, are we live? Yes, we are live. And we are live in Lemony Scented. Welcome back to the podcast that, for now, we're going to call a a special presentation. Or ooh, actually, I like that a lot. Special. Pre- uh, I was gonna. Uh, I was. I was going with either a special presentation or uh, Alf will not be seen tonight or something like that. But. Oh, actually, I like that too. Oh, damn. You know what we should do? Okay, we if we do a special presentation, we have to get that you know that HBO noise. Oh yeah, the, you know that the CBS. Uh, dun, 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 CBS, dun, dun, that's dun, it. Dun, dun. I wish we could make yeah, that the one our that name. you know. I wish we could make our name the dun 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 sound, but you can't really write that down. <laughs> yeah, that's the only problem. We'd be like um, you know Prince yeah. back when, when he wasn't when he wasn't Prince. Yeah, but, when he was uh, the artist formerly known as Prince, which was yeah. a really complicated way, as it turns out, of getting out of a bad recording deal. Was it really? Yeah. That was the whole he, thing? Yeah, he wasn't just being super pretentious. It was because he wanted to get out of a deal by uh, changing his name to something that they couldn't write down. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is, uh, that's very clever. And in fact, that just, that sounds like some the way you get out of a deal with like, you know, the devil. You yes. Know? Which like, is uh, <laughs> recording industry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not that far off when you think about it. But that that is exactly the sort of thing was like, curse you, Prince, you know. <laughs> oh, hey. All right, Prince, this time I take tops and you take bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> so Prince talented turnips. Uh, uh, turnips. <laughs> Wow, nice Prince impression. That actually, <laughs> and he spelled turnips with the the numeral two, two or nips. Uh, <laughs> anyway, tonight on a special presentation, or mm-hmm. Alf will not be seen tonight. <laughs> we should have a vote on that. Yes, okay. everyone, yell, yell real loud. Which one do you like? Do you like a special presentation? Okay. Do you like Alf will not be seen tonight? Well, according to the judge o um, <laughs> anyway, uh, tonight we're gonna, we are going to be speaking about yet another uh, comic strip that became an animated special, and tonight we're talking about Kathy. Yes, Kathy, which was written and created by Kathy Good- Guzwit? How do you pronounce her name? Do you know? Um, I've always called her Jizizowitz, but I am pretty sure that's not right. <laughs> Guy sweet? I don't know. Just I've I've only know. ever seen it spelled. So and I I'm and I've never seen another Jizwit, so uh Yeah. Um in preparation for this episode, I probably should have looked that up, because I did notice that she appeared on the Tonight Show. Presumably oh. Johnny Carson said her name when oh. he introduced her. But I couldn't be bothered to actually watch the clip, so it's a mystery. Yeah. Well, we'll take care of that, uh, Kathy Toot Sweet, as, as it were. But yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> <They can't laughs> Kathy players, folks. is a comic that uh, I wanted that I mentioned in our first podcast, being really interested in talking about, and that's because uh, when I was a kid, I hated Kathy. I thought it was the worst comic in the newspaper. And I think there's a lot to criticize about Kathy. We'll get into that in a little bit. But I also think I was being unfair to Kathy in some ways. Um, and I, I would agree with you there. And I wonder if we come to the same conclusion after we watched this uh, special. Because I was surprised to find that I was liking Kathy a lot better after I saw the special. Yeah, that's, ex- that's pretty much exactly it. Um, I, well, I found Kathy... Well, I liked Kathy as a character a lot. Um, There's still a lot of issues that I have with Kathy as as a media property. But uh, watching this uh, special did make me feel a lot uh, warmer feelings towards the character that I never felt in reading the comic strip. Yeah, and just... Well, for one thing, I think when we were reading it... See, this came out when both of us were like seven years old. And Yeah. But when we were reading the comics, I don't know if you read it all, all the time at that age... But I was reading Kathy, we started getting the newspaper more regularly when I was 10, up until when I was about 18. And at that point, Kathy had really sort of metamorphosed into another Dilbert. It was much more of a workplace thing. Hmm. Yeah, um, that's true. That's the Kathy that I'm familiar with. I didn't, I, I mean, Kathy has always been sort of about 
uh, you know, three major issues: work, work, um, food, men. and men. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's I, I believe actually it might be four uh, because I believe Kathy did come out with four collections called the four major guilt groups, which were men, work, uh, food and mom, mom, mom yes. shoes. Mom, I think, was the, the last one. So, I mean, that's kind of been Kathy's bread and butter. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, you're right. Uh, workplace humor did start taking front and center a lot more uh, in sort of the mid Kathy strips. In my uh, notes, I wrote down how surprised I was that there was. No friction between her and Mr. Pinkley. That's also yeah. That is interesting as well. Um, but I Mr. guess Mr. Pinkley yeah. is her boss, by the way. Yes, yeah. So that's actually because the special Kathy is much more about Kathy's uh, issues with her boyfriend Irving, yes. and um, we'll get into that. But first, uh, just one thing about Kathy, the comic strip, is I guess because first let's discuss. Well, first of all, let's introduce our audience to Kathy because. Yes. Uh, Kathy has been out of the paper for a few years now. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy Jesuits recently retired after uh, 30 plus years of doing the strip, Kathy. So Kathy is a single go-getter uh, career woman. Uh, I believe that's is... how she was described in the McDonald's ads too, yes. Actually, you're right. Yeah, That is exactly, I believe, word for word how she was described. And She's it is accurate. On the go. <laughs> She is um, she is a career woman in her early 20s, uh, in the early 1980s, trying to navigate the pitfalls of having it all, uh, both relationships and work. And that's probably a big reason why, as a child, I didn't gel with Kathy, because I was the wrong demographic. Yeah, uh, not if, only are you the wrong wrong age, wrong, wrong gender identity, wrong everything. So yeah. That's the thing is when I was a kid, I mean, I, I didn't like Kathy, but also all the girls I knew didn't like Kathy. So I assumed Kathy was bad, but now I think it really is. It's not just, uh, not just the gender thing, but also very much an age and, uh, generation thing. Because if you're a baby boomer, then, you know, uh, Kathy is kind of, or I should say, if you're a, a woman in your late to mid, late twenties to early thirties, in the workplace in the early 1980s, then Kathy is definitely your voice. Yeah, but were those, were those the boomers? Those were, uh, yeah, I believe those those were kind of the late late boomers, the yeah. late bloomer boomers, you might say. <laughs> Leo's a late <laughs> boomer. But... Um, yeah, I, I think um, that was the well, the baby boomers encompass sorry encompass such a large uh, you know like what 30 years of kids or something so yeah it's hard to really define them especially since our culture has decided that there are only two generations yeah uh, which makes things hard uh, we had this conversation I, last time we did i guess this is going to be a perennial topic uh, but <laughs> i do feel like perennial wah, wah, wah. we're big into rhymes tonight <laughs> i i really do feel though that the kathy is a very boomer strip uh, because so? yeah um it's you know when kathy is well here's the thing about kathy is it's a very um, – Kathy's sensibilities are very second-wave feminist where mm. it's all about trying to have it all, career and family. And I think once you get into Gen X and millennials, they've realized they'll never have either, either of those things. Yeah. So Kathy doesn't speak to them as much. Yeah, uh, for us, it's like you know just picking and choosing. Yeah, exactly. We, we would like to have it a la carte as opposed to having <laughs> it all. But that means that, like, yeah, when I was a kid, uh, that was one of the reasons I think I just didn't gel with Kathy. Um, and I kind of dismissed it uh, without, maybe without giving it a fair shake. Um, there are other criticisms of the comic strip that I believe are more valid. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Well, let's see. Who's in the comic? There's Kathy herself. You can always recognize right. Kathy because she, she has eyes very close together, shaped like an upside down heart. And... I get. I, I guess nobody else in the strip does. I guess she's unique in that respect. And you always yeah. see her, her mom and dad who look so much alike that they're almost brother and sister. Mm, well, that explains Kathy's like eyes yeah. being so close together. <laughs> and also in the strip, when we were reading it, a major character was her dog Electra, who doesn't show up in this one. That's right. I think Electra was a later addition in the strip. Yeah, because, because everything has to have a dog in it. Yeah, there was because there was that later Kathy collection called My Granddaughter Has Fleas, which I believe <laughs> is where Electra is introduced. Uh, and 
I guess that I wonder now, looking back on it, if that's some if there's some meaning in the name since Electra killed her father and married her mother. No, killed her mother, married her father. What does Electra do? I forget what Electra did. Yeah, well, the Electra complex is the one where you, uh, yeah, kill your mother and marry your father. Well, yeah. I don't know about killing the mother part in the complex, at least, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I, figured, I figured Kathy just went on a real uh, comics binge and became a huge fan of Daredevil, but... <laughs> uh, Kathy, well, I don't know. I can't see Kathy reading comics because Kathy has... Uh, I think Kathy Kathy's interests include chocolate and shoes. And that's, I mean, I, I hate to be flippant and be like, oh, women, but that's pretty much what she's into. Well, I would like to think that if there were a millennial version of Kathy, it would be, you know, food, shoes, chocolate, and yaoi. But that would be a, a much more millennial thing. Yes. Um, so yeah, if if, uh, if the kids today were going to uh, yeet on Kathy, then uh, it would be Yaoi would be it. I, I think yeet. I actually don't know what that phrase means, but I, I hear that it's used a lot with the kids. Um, actually, I also realized Kathy is the only character that has eyes at all. All the other characters have just the dots. Yeah, they, yeah, she's the a Fred Flintstone in a world of Barney Rubbles. Yeah, and she also has no nose, uh, unless. I was going to point this out in this strip uh, strip in this special. You sometimes see her from the side and she does have a little nose. So that's true. That kind of weirded me out because <laughs> I don't think that ever happened in the comic strip. It's like seeing Dilbert with a mouth on his show. Oh, yeah. Ugh. That was that was some bad energy there. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I can't wait to talk about Dilbert, too, though. <laughs> um, but uh so Kathy, the comic strip, there are a couple other characters. There are her parents. There's Mr. Pinkley, her boss, whom we've mentioned. Yeah, um, sometimes she has a very inimical relationship with him, but in this one, she seemed to like him a lot. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe I he don't got think, worse over the years. Mm, I feel like Mr. Pinkley was never a huge uh, presence in the comic strip. Uh, Maybe he I'm was confusing him with uh, the general from Beetle Bailey. I don't know. Well, I mean, Mr. Pinkley's always there, but I feel like most of the conflict in this strip is with uh, Kathy's mother and also that that woman who is basically the all-purpose salesperson who appears in every store that Kathy shops in. Yeah. Does she always go to that one store? Is it, or is this woman like her personal Grover? Who yeah, it's like that. waiting tables at every restaurant she goes to. It's like, um, I, I'm trying to think of an example, but yeah, it is that character who plays a di- it's like the devil in cow and chicken i guess That's yeah the, yeah right. who's always there playing a different role although it always has a name referring to the fact that you can see his butt yeah yeah now actually this is interesting i just read this recently that that character in kathy is never named but in the um i guess in the uh heuristic um annex uh or not annex what would you call that? The uh, the interpretive material for Kathy. Oh, uh, that okay. that character is named Mabel. Mabel. Okay. Which so which would where... imply that she actually is the same character all the time, rather than huh. just a generic woman. So in the Kathy expanded universe, she has a name. Okay. Yes. Um, and then who else do we have? There, Kathy has two friends. Uh, she, uh, Andrea is the one who's the most proactive in this story. She's. Uh, that's right. You can recognize her by her straight hair and. In this one, her running gag of attacking everyone with Binaka breath spray. Yes, because Andrea is a feminist. Yes. Also, and, because Binaka was a thing in the 80s that we don't see anymore. Uh, I do I do love how 80s this whole thing is. But it's, like we it's said. It's wonderfully 80s. It is. And it's not like... Okay, here's the thing. It's like it is it is a beautiful relic of its time. It's not like that faux kind of 80s that you get now where it's like everything's going to be day glow and they're all playing with Rubik's cubes Yeah, and you know, the synth wave soundtrack. It is the eighties as it I actually got a little was. bit of that from the Bumblebee movie. And although I did really like the Bumblebee movie, there were places where it just felt like eighties, eighties, get it? Eighties. Yeah. It's like, Hey kids, you remember this? Well, <laughs> it's back, uh, in po- pog form, except that was the nineties. So never <laughs> no, mind. Sorry. Well, it was the I believe early '90s. So if you were yeah. in if you were in Hawaii, it was back in Pog form. Well, yeah, because that's where the uh, the the legend started. Mm-hmm. The the legend of the Hawaiian Slammer Pog. 
songs. <laughs> Now, Andrea, in this comic strip, I believe, started out as uh, Kathy's kind of spitfire feminist friend, but later on gets married and has children yes. and kind of becomes the the annoying mom character of the strip, who's always forcing Aunt Kathy to deal with her horrible uh, children. So does that mean that Andrea was the one who got to have it all? Actually, I, th- I think, was she? I, I believe she retired from the workforce and became a stay-at-home mom. Hmm. So I don't, but well, I don't know that actually because I, I have know, not. I know she had babies at some point. I remember that part, but I don't remember yeah. anything about like Kathy having being pressed into uh, babysitter service or anything like that. I think it was mostly just that like she would bring her baby Zenith was the kid's name. Zenith, bring Zenith over, right. yeah, and Zenith would like break stuff, and Kathy would be like, "Ack," um, <laughs> and that was hey, the joke. That's mm-hmm. something that doesn't happen in this special. Oh, you're right. There's no acting in this. Yeah, I always wondered what act sounded like, and uh, it she doesn't act. Well, what, what's even the point? I mean, yeah. is it really Kathy if she's not acting? That's like <sighs> that's like if Here Comes Garfield started with "I love every day of the week." <laughs> yeah, Garfield <laughs> just comes on. Mm, rigatoni, <laughs> my favorite pasta. Um, I don't like to beat up dogs. <laughs> He's like, John, I appreciate and respect you. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Way, spider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This is a. Uh, so, but wait. Uh, who Garfield else is in takes Kathy? over is everything we do. <laughs> well, you know, Gar- Garfield is. He is the 1980s comic strip. Or he the is, 1980s, yeah. 1980s funny pages is Garfield. So. Everything is in his very long shadow. Yes. Um, are there any Wide other characters in Kathy? <laughs> a Y, yeah, yeah. I believe that was actually one of his books, wasn't it? Garfield casts a wide shadow. <laughs> that would be a Garfield. good one if they haven't done it yet. They are should, you, so... Are you listening, Paws Incorporated? <laughs> yeah, but we want royalties on this one. <laughs> um, so who else is in Kathy? That's about the entire cast, I think. The secretary, but I don't remember her name. Oh... Is that Charlene or is Charlene? No, Charlene, Charlene is her other friend. I think it starts with an L. Hmm. Okay, then. Well, I forget. Okay. Frizzy hair girl who looks almost exactly like uh, Dilbert's triangle haired friend. Oh, yeah, that's Charlene. So that's Kathy's work friend, as okay. opposed to Andrea, who's her, I guess, you know, uh, feminist friend. I don't remember if Andrea has a. Uh, works at the same uh, company or not. I, I don't think Andrea does. Again, no. I probably should have done some research into this, but it's Kathy, so it's Kathy, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I like how there's there's um, like 30 plus years of Kathy canon, but only about eight facts have been established, and we can't be bothered to actually remember any of them. Yeah, that that ties into what I want to what I want to conclude this whole thing with. But anyway, oh, okay. let's, let's talk about the actual the special itself. Because yes. A lot of this stuff is not part of the. Not part of the story. There's no, we mentioned there's no Electra. We we barely see her parents. Her, her mom is always a bigger focus in the in the comics than anything else. Well, right. Oh, and we never see the sales lady either. We don't see Mabel. Oh, that's right. I wonder if she had. I wonder if she'd even been uh, established yet. Yeah, I don't know. I, she does appear in subsequent Kathy specials, so maybe yeah, she was around this after point. this one. Huh. Um. And yeah, so that's yeah. So those are the main the main cast we have in this one, except for uh, one. The the, oh. the thing that everything cru- crucially orbits around is Irving. Yes. So Irving, if we haven't mentioned before, is Kathy's on and off boyfriend. On and off, off and on, and then eventually they did actually get married in the strip. So. And that was that was the end of Kathy. That was when Kathy retired upon their marriage. Actually, uh, no, no, not when no. She, not when they're married. It was when she announced her pregnancy. Oh, that's right. There was a bit of Kathy married life. Yeah, and... we saw a little bit of their married life, and then the very last strip was her, her making a little hint and seeing a little thought bubble emerge from her stomach, going "hack." Oh, uh, <laughs> I get it. Yes. Um, I'm just gonna say right now, Kathy is too good for Irving. Yes. The first thing I've written on my notes is Irving is fucking dog shit and she should never have married him. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, I know, I remember from the marriage strips in Kathy that it was like, God, these, they seem really ill-suited for each other. They really, I mean, obviously 
it's a comic. You're always the the conflict strives the humor, so that's why you get stuff like the Lockhorns. But that's all we ever get of them. No, and it is absolutely clear that Irving is more devoted to his hobbies, especially sports, than he will ever be to Kathy. So yes, and because it's the '80s, he's playing racquetball. Racquetball. <laughs> It's like, remember racquetball? <laughs> Getting to Highline next. But... <laughs> yeah, that was a... So that's the thing. So this this special, it revolves around Kathy winning the uh, coveted Employee of the Year award at her mm-hmm. company. She is the best at being employed, and her company <laughs> wants to recognize this. So she's going to receive an award, but Irving... Really? We don't know oh. what her company does, by the way. They they get accounts. Yeah. And they 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 get accounts, and then they create synergy, I guess. Um, <laughs> now, I will say, and I'm gonna guess. This is just a this is just a guess because Kathy is uh, based on the life of Kathy Jesuitz, and in real life, Kathy Jesuitz was an advertising executive before oh. she became a cartoonist. Oh, I didn't know and, that. That makes sense. Yeah, apparently she was creating Kathy Comics as a way of venting about issues in her workplace, and her parents badgered her into submitting them to the syndicate, and that's how she became uh, a syndicated cartoonist. Huh. And uh, she was actually the vice president of her company when this happened, so she was apparently very embarrassed when Kathy first came out, but eventually <laughs> she was so successful, she resigned and devoted herself to cartooning full-time. Well, good for her, you know? Yeah. Shoot. Again, this is something that when I read it, I thought, this is such a boomer story. Just the idea, like, you could be top of, you could be a vice president in a company, and then also become a successful cartoonist, and it's just like, man, well, living the dream. How do you uh, write a comic about the struggle to have it all when it all fell in your lap? Yeah. I mean, not to... Not to denigrate the, the work no, no. that I'm sure she put in, but yeah, it really does... I. I you know, as someone who wanted to be a cartoonist, you know, when I was a child and just dreamed of that, I would be like, when I read that story, I was like, man, that is, that is just the dream, just to have it kind of fall into place like that. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I just feel like nowadays um, it would be a lot harder for someone to do that, to just yeah. kind of waltz in off the street. Though it's, you know, in the 80s, that sort of thing wasn't unheard of. Gary Larson kind of did the same thing. He just, yeah. you know, wandered in and, you know got picked up so he got a lot of well actually yeah he gave maybe we should save this story for uh when we do tales of the, from the far side but uh as i heard it he had to hang around a a phone booth which was the telephone number he'd given them <laughs> oh the 80s yeah. man Ugh, again life has changed so much yeah um but and, more than and, yeah. one important way that life has changed is that the comic strip industry was huge at the time, which is why there were all these animated specials. Yeah, yeah. So it was a lot more likely that you just get picked up because there was a need for comic strips. Yeah. I mean, especially when you look at these things and realize that a lot of these comics at the time were, I won't say revolutionary because they're comic strips, but mm. very they were new voices. Like there was no comic strip for and by women at the time. No. Really. I mean, still isn't, really. Yeah. I mean, I don't know who the millennial Kathy is. Um, maybe if I read the newspaper, I'd know, but yeah. uh, well, I'm just going to... Millennials don't read the newspaper, so there's kind of no point in it. So. That's true. Well, yeah. Well, it would be a webcomic. Is there a Probably. webcomic, Kathy? Of... Um, I don't know. Hmm. That, that one about the nun? The nun? <laughs> It's, it's, uh, oh, wait, is it the pregnant nun? Yes, that one. Oh, that one. Sis- Sister Claire. Yes. I like how, I like how I was like, nun, is, of course I know the one that's about her, pre- it's a pregnant nun, right? Yeah. Yes. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I've, I've read that one uh-huh. for completely non purient reasons. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. yes. Well, having read it myself, I too read it for completely non purient reasons because there were none. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, um, man, yeah, th- but no, that's totally relatable for the kids nowadays to, <laughs> you know, read about, uh, you know, pregnant nun web comics. Um, that's, it's, the, it's the, uh, equivalent of having it all in the eighties. Yes. Yeah. God, I'm trying to think like, what is a, well, I guess there's, oh, what is, 
I can't think of an equivalent to Kathy uh, nowadays. You know, I'm, I'm sure. Trying to, I'm trying to come up with something that the kids are really into, and it's either you know not not as representative of their life as Kathy would have been. But maybe we don't need that anymore. Maybe we just maybe the fact maybe that's something that social media has taken the place of. We don't need to see our lives sent up because we're seeing other people send up their own lives all over the place. That's true. That's true. Um, but I, and I feel like that's the thing is like whenever you see a comic or anything posted online and someone just replies with big mood or yeah. relatable, that's or pretty this. much – yeah, that's pretty much Kathy in a nutshell or yes. most comics uh, that were in the paper in those days. Wait, uh, but anyway – Wait. The new Nancy. Oh yeah, that's, that's the new right, Kathy. Oh, it's that, and I love it. So absolutely, you know, you're absolutely right. That is that is a new Kathy. Uh, she's speaking to the trials and tribulations of today's modern a go go young woman. Yes, and um, Sluggo is lit after yes. all. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're we were speaking of dog shit Irving. The, yes, Irving. Who I mean. I can think of no one who more deserves to be dissected. This guy, okay, so Kathy uh, is upset because Irving is going to be out of town when, no, I shouldn't say she's upset. She is dealing with this because yes. she's not happy, but as a modern career a go go woman, she is um, getting zen about it. She's like, I understand Irving needs his space, he needs to do his thing, I'm not going to be upset about this. And then her mom talks her into being upset about it, basically. Such a mom thing to do. Of course, um, she, her mom was absolutely right. Which yes, she, yes, that's true. And, um, she, and as she's doing this, she takes the three peas that uh, Kathy has in her uh, in her fridge and somehow assembles them into a full turkey dinner. I really like that. That was a, yeah. that was a fun little sight gag, <laughs> um, I, and really kind of a stat. I liked it because it's never re remarked on. But it's a very clever, subtle way to kind of establish Kathy's mother's character as yes. a mother. It's just a very mom thing to do. Be, um, being a mom is her life, and she does it well. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, now, what do you think of the animation in general? I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, it, reminded, oh, it reminded me a lot of the Peanuts specials, because I believe it's the same person, actually. Yeah, Bill Melendez. He did a bunch of these kind of things. He yeah, a, and... Mm -hmm. He did, uh, he did the Kathy specials, all the Peanuts specials, a couple of Betty Boop specials. Oh, and, okay. And a couple of weird original character specials called the Skywalker Kids. and Like Luke Skywalker? Uh, it was in the 80s, so probably, but uh, it's... Uh, Is uh, it like... Uh, it, like... It felt like, his, like if he had a fight with Charles Schultz and wanted to create his own Peanuts gang. Oh, okay. All right. Which he didn't. You know, he did Snoopy to the end of his days. So, yeah. Um, well, you know, he brings the same charm that the Peanut Specials have to yes. Kathy because I actually thought, you know, it's it's a little bit it it's really captures the feel of the strip, uh, feel of the art, but um, I don't know. It, it kind of the the characters kind of come alive. I liked it a lot. Yeah, um, Kathy has a really well animated face. You have a you get a yes. lot of you get a lot of emotions showing sometimes in rapid succession. I was watching. Yeah, there's one scene where you see all these her doing all these complicated gestures with her hands, and her hands are just these little five pointed flippers. But uh, you get <laughs> but you get that from all. But uh, the emotion she's. Uh, she's making is very visible in all of them. So uh, it was a really good way of uh, doing much with little, I would say. I'm yeah, not, absolutely. I, don't know if, I wonder if T Kathy Gooseweid herself uh, d drew the animation models. Hmm, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, you know, one thing that I, I do like about this is since it's animated, it does uh, avoid one of the things that I've always disliked about the Kathy comic strip, which is reams and reams of dialogue because every comic uh every kathy comic has about uh, a bible's worth of writing in it uh, yeah it's and... really kind of some of them kind of feel like that one scene in crumb where you're flipping through charles's comics and, they <laughs> begin to be, and the images begin to disappear under line after line of text and yeah it's uh, the characters uh, are literally going peekaboo under the uh 
under the panels, <laughs> under these giant <laughs> speech balloons. It's Kathy Jizzizowitz, it's Horror Vacui. Um, <laughs> she's, there's so much dialogue. And also, because Kathy, basically, here's the thing about Kathy, is you read the first panel and you know what the punchline is going to be. There's yes. never any surprise. But you still got to read, like, four to six more panels worth of dialogue to actually get to that punchline. Yeah. And it's so little payoff. And that's another reason that I always dislike Kathy. And I feel like that criticism is a little more uh, valid than some of the other ones that I had. But uh, but anyway, this special avoids that. And uh-huh. that makes it a lot more pleasant. Um, now, as we were saying, Kathy, uh, Kathy's mother uh, warns her about Irving. So she goes to visit Irving. And he's all la da happy to see him. And of course, he's got another woman there with him. Yeah. And Kathy, to her credit, takes this in remarkable stride. Um, I don't know if she was taking it in stride so much as she was in giant denial. It was extremely weird because I, I mean, I, she has every right to be livid and basically to, you know, p- fucking punch Irving in the face or something. <laughs> um but she does this weird thing where she's like, Irving, or I guess maybe it was that Irving kind of does a sob story about how, like, I gave up racquetball for you, but you're too focused on your career. And Kathy's like, Irving, you're right. I'm so sorry. And it's like, why are you apologizing, Kathy? You're right. He's he done was, you wrong. He was manipulating her from the start. I I mean, uh, if I, you know, if, if my girlfriend if, was all like, I'm going to go to my job and I was like, this justifies me like having an affair. I'd be like, I don't, I don't think she would, I I don't think that flies at all. No, no. Yeah. Kathy kind of, she is kind of like in, you know, maybe cause she seems to think that this is a fling and she's more forgiving of Irving at first until she Mm -hmm. notices that there is butter on a plate in his refrigerator. She, by recognizing how well she, this other woman has organized his fridge, she is able to calculate to the day how long he's been seeing her. And so, so now, Kathy something is Something about that reminds me of something kind of creepy that my dad keeps telling me, which is he says, you shouldn't be using fabric softener. If women smell that you're using it, they'll think you're married. <laughs> um... <laughs> That's interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> also, you shouldn't wash your hair. Women will think you're married. I feel like this is all tying into those Reddit posts that have been going around where guys are like, I'm not going to wipe my butt after I use a toilet. That's gay. You know, <laughs> you know just like uh, uh, basically, yeah. So what we've learned from Kathy is men are complete helpless slobs who need a woman to you know, take care of them. Yeah. Uh, men, men are really trying to date a new mom. Yeah. Well, I guess when you think about it, Kathy's not wrong on this, um, men are trash. Uh, uh, and Irving is the trashiest of them all. Uh, Ir- uh, Irving is garbage. Um, after We're this is revealed the Irving show. That's Irv- new, yeah. This is name for this podcast. The we no Irving Irvings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Irving no is Irvings. just the, I, I don't I never saw in the comic strip what Kathy saw in Irving because he is basically a stereotypical man who likes man things like sports and Bruce Springsteen. And that's about it. Um, It's a, you know, because Irving is now out of Kathy's life, she needs to find a date for the big award show. And how is a single woman in the eighties going to find a man? I don't get it. I just like I don't get why the why this was necessary, but maybe that just shows that I'm part of a different generation. That's true. I, I maybe this was a bigger issue back then. I, I feel like going to an award show by yourself now would kind of be okay. Honestly, I can't imagine anyone in your workplace caring yeah. about who you're dating. Everyone's that gonna be staring of... at my date. And Yeah. Uh and as we see, it, it ends up not really being a problem for her in the first place, but I think it's, she listened too much to her mom. Her yes. mom like put all these ideas in her head. Um, oh, here's here's one of my favorite things I wrote in the note about. She's talking about how her mom has been trying to fix her up with guys all her life to the point where there was a picture of the baby that was next to Kathy in the incubators in the scrapbook of Kathy's childhood. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. I, I, I saw that scene and it's just like, well, 
the cishets are at it again. <laughs> this, this is, you know, so much of it is about Andrea's not wrong. Fe- we need feminism. And this is one of the reasons why. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting, I, I guess Ka- Kathy kind of demonstrates, you know, what life was like for women at that time. Uh-huh. Very much so. And, and it's a, I, I guess, I don't know an accurate representation of the time period. And, and in yeah. many ways, you know, I mean, struggles. Oh, well, well, if Kathy's a boomer, what's her mother? Greatest generation. Yeah. Her mom would be greatest generation. Right? Okay. Um, her dad was probably, he was, you know, her dad was like a war vet. Wasn't yeah. He? Maybe. Should... <laughs> I don't remember. Her dad like literally has three lines in the entire 30 years of Kathy. So <laughs> I don't think we ever get to know anything about him. Oh, fun uh, fact about the, uh, about this special though. Her, her dad is voiced by a guy whose last name is Guizwait. So it might be oh. her real dad for all we know. You know, it, it would make sense because how often do you see people with that name? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I have a pretty rare last name myself, and you know, anyone you meet with that last name is almost guaranteed to be related to me somehow. So that's true. Um, and I've got a rare name; only uh, three people in the world have. So if you meet someone with it, <laughs> um, at least my full last yeah, name. yeah, the hyphenated last name, yeah. yeah. The one that, that is literally both my parents' names shoved together, so um, it's literally just me and my brother and sister. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, yeah. So, uh, what were we talking about? Oh well, we're here's speaking a, of Irving. Here's another thing. We uh, it cuts back from commercial, and we get like two or three frames of Kathy eating out of a giant burlap bag of donuts, and then throwing it yeah. away. I, I was really annoyed. I was like, come on, more of that. <laughs> it was like, what, 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 what? You cut off the good part? Uh, <laughs> then it's just Kathy looking at her answering machine. Yes. Which, again, very 80s. The idea is like, oh, I got to get home to check my answering machine. Oh, yeah. There's but, that oh. cute little thing about we have such incredible technology. We can get phones shaped like animals. It was the 80s. Yes. We have. It's s- like everyone's got a Snoopy phone or a Garfield phone. An answer then. phone, speaker phone. She mentions cell phones, actually, which oh, I did was she? wondering wow. about. Well, I knew yeah, there were. Th- was like, I knew there were a thing in 1987, but they were like suitcase sized. Yeah, so I feel like she was probably just like she just looked up like what kind of phones are there. Here's the kind of phone that nobody actually has, but it exists. So you know, three scientists at MIT have this ARPANET um, phones. Yeah. <laughs> um, Information yeah. superhighway phones. We got we've got cyber phones, we've got astro phones, we've got future phones, we got space phones, we got nano phones. Um, yeah, it's, and, this, it's, and it's, all this listing phones is just leading up to the fact that we still yell at the phone. Call me. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, relatable. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so Kathy goes on a bunch of dates, and no, actually. Yeah, and they don't. She doesn't actually go on dates. She fails to go on dates mostly. Yeah, she keeps um, meeting guys and not and striking out with them. One of them builds a wall of goldfish crackers to avoid her. And yeah, well, okay, so that where was that because, coming from? So, so Andrea, it is Andrea, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, Andrea is the one who's taking take, on the dates. That's right. She takes Kathy to a sushi restaurant. It's which, really, of course. The window sushi sign says up. "Sushi Cappuccino Pasta Incorporated." Well, okay, so it is basically – okay, so basically this restaurant is like one of those weird buffets where they serve both Asian and American food. Yeah. And you know it's all bad. Uh, and Andrea thinks this is a good place to pick up men. It sounds like they were just you, put it, listing everything that was uh, trendy in the 80s. So it could have been sushi, cappuccino, pasta, cheesecake, potato bar. Oh, God, I remember potato bars. Yeah. Those were fun, actually. <laughs> Baked potatoes were good for you back Yeah. Then. It's like, yeah. Um, actually, I remember that they were a thing, but I mostly know they were a thing from uh, the brunching shuttlecocks mentioning them. Yes. Uh, Love you, Lord. Uh, so Kathy and Andrea go to this sushi cappuccino pasta bar to meet men, and they do meet a man. He sits at the table with Kathy, and they build these castles full of goldfish crackers to avoid actually – interacting with each other because i guess goldfish crackers are the appetizer at a sushi restaurant <laughs> <laughs> they're fish shaped so i guess they're appropriate I guess. how it, many it's, sushi bars have they been to at this point i mean admittedly i, I maybe, hadn't i hadn't been to one until i started dating in the late 90s so 
Yeah, I didn't go to, you know, Japanese food, I think, was relatively unknown at this point in the 80s. Um, yeah. You know, I, as I recall, as a child of the 80s, if you wanted ethnic food, it was pretty much Italian or Chinese. Um, everything else beyond that was just like, you know, beyond the pale. And I didn't see Japanese food or Indian food until the 90s. And, you know, even then it was fairly exotic. So Yeah, I, I mean, sushi. we were still experimenting with other kinds of Chinese food. I, you know, I, I always think of the line where the, uh, the mean stepmom from Beetlejuice says, I can't believe we're eating Cantonese. Is there no Szechuan here? <laughs> That's true. Actually, until, um, for most of the eighties, you were eating, um, American style Chinese food. Yes. Which is of course, you know, um, the kind of, I think is actually mostly, is it Cantonese? Yes. Is Cantonese is, yeah, the Cantonese yeah. is generally what was brought over early on in the 1800s, that yeah. kind of thing. And then you've got like this bastardized version of Cantonese that is, you know, made with whatever ingredients were available here in the States and adapted to suit, you know, American yeah. tastes. And um, it's its own thing. It's actually kind of interesting because there are a lot of restaurants, especially up where I am, that advertise American style Chinese food to distinguish it from the authentic Chinese <laughs> food from China. Uh, which is full of all sorts of weird exotic spices that make Americans go, oh, I, I don't know. About Ooh, that. Don't know. star like, anise, never mind. Yeah, it's like, and they're like, when you get like a, a hot pot, it's like, oh gosh, oh my, there's like, uh, there's pepper in this, oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, so sushi, I believe, was a thing, it's it's synonymous with the 80s in the sense that I, I believe like Gordon Gecko style executives would eat it. Yeah. But, you know, the hoi polloi wasn't too familiar with. You know, anything Which, that you could have uh, with a three martini lunch was hot in the 80s. So, And since Kathy is a career, go a, a, a modern woman on the go, yes. uh, sushi kind of fits for her. But but anyway, it, she doesn't work out with yeah. this guy at the sushi bar. So also, I want to the- draw attention to the fact that every time they go out and do something, Andrea is wearing a scarf around her neck, looking like the girl in the green ribbon ghost story. <laughs> And apparently well, that was a thing in the eighties too, was that women were, they were struggling to find the equivalent of the necktie for women. And for a while there, it was a neck scarf. Oh, actually. Oh, that explains a lot because I've seen a lot of old pictures of my mom at work in those days. And she huh. always got that. Yeah. That kind of thing. That's like, Oh, it's like a uh, Fred from Scooby-Doo's ascot. Isn't it? Yeah, like, exactly. What's up there. Oh, I didn't know that. Or just tight, um, but it's generally just tied around the bare neck rather than part of the part of the suit, as in uh, tied around the collar of the of the top. Oh. So it's more like a Hanna Barbera character's tie. Yeah, exactly. Like, it makes your head easier to animate or fall off eventually yes. when you you know confess it. <laughs> dun right dun dun. <laughs> and when An- right before Andrea dies, that's what she you know she is like to her husband, whose name I can't remember or this. This it's all of the animated special Kathy in a dark, dark room. <laughs> it's uh, the one that was animated by Guillermo del Toro. Oh. Um, uh, but uh, Kathy goes to uh, some other place. She tries to uh, hit on a guy at an exercise class. And this one is interesting because Andrea um, goes on all about – oh, no. Kathy and Andrea have this argument where they discuss where you're supposed to be in the classroom – uh, depending on your marital your relationship status, which maybe was like a a thing back in the eighties, I would kind of watch that. And it's like what? I don't think this scene don't... was in the version that I watched. Oh really? Oh, because <laughs> basically, uh, Kathy's like, "Why are we in the front of the room?" And Andrea's like, "Well, because it's the best place to you know catch a man." <laughs> and Kathy's like, "Singles are supposed to be in the back of the room. Front of the room is for people with who are married." And um, I was kind of like, oh, I, I guess that was some sort of secret hanky code of the 80s that I'm unfamiliar wow. with. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Kathy tries to pick up a guy and it doesn't go very well for her. Uh, what are you going to do? So she's, no. she's back to square one. Um, and then she gets she, she gets set up with a blind date by what's her name? The non Dilbert girl. And oh, yeah. So Charlene sets her up with some guy. Yeah. Steve. Steve. And, and her mom um, gets super excited. It's like, Kathy and Steve with matching brown hair. Because Kathy just completely speculates that he might have brown hair. 
I don't remember. Did he have brown hair? <laughs> I think he was blonde, actually. <laughs> That's actually kind of funny. Uh, that is. That's a neat, there's some there's some cleverness in this, you know, in this special. Um, no, but he arrives, and I think Andrea happens to also be there, and he just says, "Oh, two women, or what is he? Two for the price. Two, two for the, the price, price of one. one. <laughs> and he gets a face full of banaka. So yes, that's the end of Steve. Then, yeah. Um, so Kathy uh, ends up going to the award alone. Well, the not quite alone. Humiliation. Not quite alone. Yes. Her her date for the her date for this is a bag full of Irving's stuff. Yeah, Irving wants his Springsteen tapes back. Yeah, so she so she says, "Well, if you want all of your stuff back, I'll have it with me at the event. Wear a tie." And he shows yeah. up not wearing a tie because he's got her tie. Oh, that's right. It's in the bag. Yes. So so he comes and um they start fighting over the bag because <laughs> Kathy basically wants him to sit there throughout the ceremony and, you know, see him, see her accepting the award. And Irving, who even now can't figure out how the game is played, just <sighs> wants his stuff from the bag and I is know. willing to fight her instead of sitting for three minutes. Kathy, sorry, you can do better. Seriously. You can I, do I, so much better. It's it's not. I mean, really, it's Irving is the worst. I mean, I, uh, uh, okay, okay. Anyway, let's take the one other man that I can name that I remember seeing dating Kathy, Steve Dallas. Oh, that's right. Better for her than Irving or non? Better. Better? Because really? Better. Well, let's let's. Their sole interaction is that Steve Dallas mentions to Kathy when he comes to pick her up for their date, that he brought his toothbrush, which ah! is considerate. Yes. <laughs> it is more considerate than anything that Irving has done for her in 30 years. It shows that he was actually planning ahead, something that Irving right. cannot do, even if it was also, planning ahead to sleep with her. Okay. And let, also, uh, assuming that Irving... Uh, okay, so here's what we know about Irving. We know that he and Kathy have nothing in common. Absolutely so we're Absolutely nothing. So I'm going to assume that Irving is a sexual dynamo and is just amazing in bed. Um, maybe he's a very giving lover. It doesn't really fit his personality. No, no. He seems like he'd be really selfish in bed. Yeah. Um, I think he would be. I mean, especially given the time period. I also, I mean, like, I love Kathy in this in this special, but she's kind of a doormat, and I really don't feel like she would she would express her needs in the bedroom. No. I don't think that she would insist on receiving as well as giving. Um, but I can I can assuming... already see a Kathy strip where she's like where they've just had sex and she's like, "Oh boy, here comes the cuddling." And it's just him reaching over her to set her alarm so she can wake up and make breakfast for him. That is 100%. You know, if Kathy was running in something slightly less G-rated than the Daily Paper, <laughs> that would absolutely be a Kathy strip. I should draw the strip. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we should do it to like, and we could like illustri illustrate this episode with that. <laughs> um, but, but assuming that, okay, I'm going to assume on the basis of how a stopped clock is still right twice a day, mm -hmm. that Irving, even if he is the most selfish lover, um, might be able to please Kathy by sheer accident just because he's he's just you know jackhammering away and <laughs> accidentally you know hits her G spot or something. <laughs> I'm just gonna maybe okay, and that's why she stays with him. Do you think she goes now, Ack? She, Absolutely. <laughs> I think there there are four well let me explain them. There there are four kinds of orgasms as we know. There's the positive, yes, oh yes, oh yes, uh -huh. the negative, oh no, oh no, oh no. The religious, oh God, oh God, oh God, and you know the Kathy. Ah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so assuming that Irving, did you get that from uh, Gallagher? Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard that one? No, that was a guess. <laughs> no, I, actually, it wasn't. It was a joke that I, I heard back in college. Uh, except the, the last bit was different, and uh, in, in was basically the last one my roommate was telling him. She's like, and, the, and there's the fake one. Oh, Mike. Oh, Mike. And I was like, I don't get it. And he was like, and they're like, I'm insulting. I'm saying you're like, bad in oh. bed, Michael. <laughs> I was like, flowers. 
I was like, I don't understand. Nobody says my name in bed. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> this is a long time ago. But anyway, um, I was single at the time uh, and kind of slow. But anyway. Um, uh, I thought you met your wife in high school. No, no, we was met college? in college. Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess this I don't think actually- if there being anime clubs in college. Yeah, I, we met. I, this was a joke told to me first year of college, and uh, I met my wife second year of college. And basically, I heard this joke, and it was like, "Well, I'll show you. I'm going to go out there and get a woman." <laughs> and uh, well, yeah. it worked. Uh, Shoot, it worked. <laughs> yeah, we've had a, we're, we've been together as long as Kathy was a comic strip. Wow. Uh, oh wait, no, we haven't actually. No? <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Not yet. Um, that would require us to actually get together when I was like five years old, I think. Um, anyway, sorry about this digression into my personal life. <laughs> the point I was making I haven't is... had sex in 10 years. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I bit him. <laughs> I thought we were sorry. I thought we were leading up to a joke there. Um, but uh, the, the, the joke that I – sorry, not the joke. The point <laughs> I was getting to is uh, if, if Irving is a good lover and Steve, Steve Dallas – I it is pretty much got to be the same, right? Yeah. In bed. So it comes down to who is who. Who's got more better looks? Who would you rather have in bed with you, Steve Dallas or Irving, who has no last name, as far as I know? Uh, can I pick Steve Dallas with the perm? Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. Oh, you know what? He would be. He would be a giving lover. Yes, he would. Maybe a little he too a, giving. Yeah. He was a very sensitive new age guy. Yeah. When he had the perm. Um, <laughs> I forget. Was his, was his brain was scrambled by aliens. Yeah, his brain right? got scrambled by aliens, and he became the opposite of who he was. And I would, I would absolutely, yes, yeah, Steve Dallas. I would perm. sleep with that Steve Dallas. I admit it. <laughs> yeah. That I um yeah. So there you go. Um, did Steve? So wait, is Dallas's last name? It is, right? Yes. Yeah, his I last name realize. is oh, okay. And Kathy's I, last name is Andrews. I only learned that yeah. from this special. Yeah, I actually didn't know that before this. I kind of assumed that it was unstated because... Yeah. Hey, do you be, think she's related to Archie? Well, y- you know what? They are very similar milk toast personalities. Yes. Um, who are also... Kathy and Archie are both desperate to be in relationships. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, and... You know, the difference is, yeah, and plus, uh, Archie is, he's kind of a dumbass <laughs> in the same way where he's like, I don't know, should I be with Veronica or Betty? <laughs> and it's like, clearly the answer is Veronica, you goddamn moron. What? Why Veronica? Would... Or are you, are you a Betty man? Uh, actually, no, I, I was leading up to a joke. I don't even, I don't oh, sorry. even know. <laughs> I don't let's know. That's try, like let's take it again. Let's but, ri- wind that back. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he should be with Veronica. Veronica. Wait, wait. No, I'm supposed to. <laughs> we did it wrong again. <laughs> we did it wrong again. Okay, we no, say it again. Never mind. Go on. Okay, go. moving on. <laughs> moving on. on. I don't All know. Right. It just sounded like to me like no. Obviously, he should have picked Shinobu over Lum, but <laughs> I wait. You mean uh, uh, shampoo? Oh, uh, no, that was the other series. No, I'm thinking of Urze Yatsura. Oh, they're different? I thought they were the same. No, no, Ranma is uh, from like f- a couple of years later. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, well, they're, they're different uh, things, I, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know the Japan <laughs> I'm not a nerd. I'm just a guy on a podcast about Kathy. Uh, <laughs> With, you, know, uh, how, you know, how masculine and uh, neurotypical can you get, really? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This is this is a you know it's a very it's a manly strip, Kathy. Um, <laughs> for manly men. Uh, but anyway, um, they have this little fight. But then Kathy gets her award. She gets up on stage, accepts her award. Uh, thanks, Mister Pinkley. Yes, which you mentioned again. This is um, really weird because I I remember her having a much worse relationship with Mister Pinkley, and he and she never even fights with him in this one, except when. You know, at one point he says, uh, "You're not gonna let me let your feelings for Irving interfere with your uh, big moment, are you?" And then her and her friend and her not Dilbert friend uh, sticks up for her and then says, "Please don't blow your nose on the uh, on the corporate accounts." Or something like that. Yes, um, I thought it was interesting. It's Mr. Pinkley is kind of a non-entity in this special. Yeah, you know, he's kind of in the background, so it seemed weird that they called attention to him at that bit. Um, and I thought they were setting up a joke because um, after Kathy gets off stage, Mr. Pinkley kind of comes up to her and is like, that was beautiful. 
and Kathy bursts into tears, shoves her award at him, and then runs out of the room. And I thought there was going to be some kind of <laughs> it joke sounded coming. yeah, it was like building up to a you like me, you really like me, but no, yeah, but it doesn't quite come. So I'm I'm wondering if something got cut, maybe but, a knows? lot got cut. They cut the they cut all the parts where she eats donuts. So <laughs> yeah, which is unforgivable. I mean, really, that would bump this up to a top tier special. So then she's she runs out into the hall and Irving is there. She's surprised to see that he's still there. And they get into a kind of, a you know, venting match about each other. And when Irving yells, you can really hear that it's Rob Paulson. Oh, wow. You're right. You can really hear. He sounds just like when Arthur gets mad at the tick and yells at him. <laughs> oh, my God. I did not even notice that. But you're absolutely right. He's it's... got that same kind of uh, kind of. Um glandular uh, uh <laughs> that kind of voice yeah yeah that one that oh. but irving and kathy kind of have this little tiff and irving is mad because it turns out that the woman he left kathy for also nagged him in the exact same ways that kathy does uh so that brings them back together yeah, because if some if you get dumped for somebody that's exactly like you it kind of feels like a win. <laughs> I, yeah, I get. Because I mean, got, she, you're you're rid of this guy who wasn't really good for you, but he's hooked on you. So yeah, that's a weird that's a go. weird sort of living well best revenge thing going on. Yeah, yeah. So it it works. Um, I don't know. It's it's one of those things where it's like, is this a happy ending or a sad ending? It's an ending. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, Kathy has this kind of nice little monologue that I. I actually really liked it. I felt like it tied the room together and the, but, and it yeah. shows that depressingly little has changed in how we treat each other since the eighties, as far as any of this goes. You know, it, it's appropriate that this was animated by the guy who animated peanut specials, because it does have that very same kind of bittersweet melancholy. You know, kind of like, yeah. 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 It's, it's, not a depressing ending, but it's not an entirely uplifting ending either. It's just kind of a, it's like, well, we're going to be doing this dance yeah. forever. You it's, know, you know forever, it's not forever. a happily ever after, but it's, there's, there's an after at least. And that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it, um, yeah. So it, that's, um, well, I guess Ethan, let me, uh, let me act you a question. <laughs> <laughs> How, Overall, how are your feelings about uh, Kathy, and would you recommend this special to our listeners? Um, you know, I would recommend it. In fact, because, as I mentioned, I, I found myself liking Kathy just as a property a lot more after seeing this. And I started to think that maybe my problem with Kathy was never with the characters or the writing. It was with the format. I think Kathy would have been better in a longer format, perhaps even as a comic book instead of a comic strip. I have not considered that, but it makes a lot of sense. I've, you know, uh, because there there was at the time a burgeoning uh, indie indie comics by widget, by women thing, not industry, cottage industry, I guess you would say, going on. We had uh, we had a lot of independent uh, people. People like oh um, oh shoot uh, Betchdell and uh, oh yes what's her name and her famous test yes yes the dykes to watch out for got started around that time and uh, there was another one that I remember called bitchy bitch that was really funny but uh, oh wait was that no is that that's not hothead Pison 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 hothead hothead lesbian terrorist. Hothead no. something, lesbian no. terrorist? Well, no, maybe I'm, a, I'm... No, I don't think so, but... I'm thinking of something else. Yeah. Really. I don't oh, think this one was necessarily uh, necessarily in the queer lit category, but, you know, maybe that was kind of... Maybe that, that was another problem with Kathy, was that she was... It was a little too aggressively uh, white cis hat, as we said. Yeah, it's it's very much so about the problems of the, the white cis hat. I mean, half of this is about, like, her mom, like... You Can know, you name a black kids. character in Kathy? No, not none. It's a very white bread cast, which yeah. uh, I would... I mean, I can't fault, fault Kathy for too much, since it was a style at the time. Yes. I believe the only... A uh, comic strip that had a black character, not count was I mean, it, I, it was, but there's peanuts. Yeah, there's Franklin from that, Peanuts. Then you've got yeah, Wee Pals, Franklin, and Wee Pals. Oh, I forgot about Wee Pals. Yes, mm -hmm. Wee Pals. 
And um, then there was, uh, uh, I think it was, was it Curtis? Curtis, or Crankshaft yeah. Crankshaft that came first. Did Crankshaft but, have a black character? I don't remember. Oh, not Crankshaft. What am I thinking of? The guy, the Funky guy, Winker he's a cop. Oh, no, Jumpstart. No, a, Jumpstart, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Jump, I don't I don't know if Jumpstart had gotten started in 87, but I remember. I think that was a little later. So yeah, it was I a little a later. While, and I always, yeah, lo- I think, I always loved Jumpstart. That's one I'm sorry never had a uh, special or a series. Yeah, that's one that really never got its due, I no. think, because that was actually a very funny comic. Very funny. Um, I mean, I especially like the whole gimmick of how when the how he gets around the trouble of changing the children's character models to make them older by just having one day preschooler Sonny uh, taps toddler Sonny on the on the shoulder. He's like, hey, time for you to go. I'm replacing you. <laughs> that was a clever one, but yeah, uh, yeah. Um, that one kind of. Uh, I, I remember. I think a lot of time. Oh, I mean, uh, and of course the Boondocks. Let's not forget the Boondocks. Oh, the Boondocks. That's another. Oh, I forgot that got its own animated series as well. Yeah, we got to focus on that one sometime. There are some really good yeah. ones to. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about that one because that is another strip that was that did not uh, get its due. I think absolutely it's not. Fun. No, um, it was. It was. Let's be honest. It was too threatening yeah. for white America because I remember when it ran, my entire uh, local newspaper was full of angry letters from old white people uh. who were all like, well, you know, I really um, – you know, I've got plenty of black friends and um, uh, but I just don't <laughs> like these these uh, ugly pictures that you've got in the paper now. I um, mean I, – yeah. There, I mean, I would have loved to have had the boondocks in my paper. What we had was La Cucaracha. I don't know if that one lasted for very long. I've never heard of that one. What it, is that one? Uh, it was It was about this... It was a sort of uh, Mexican-American point of view strip where there was a guy and his, I guess, imaginary friend, the giant talking cockroach, who was kind of a representative of La Raza. And it, it wasn't good. It wasn't funny. <laughs> Okay, and, and it definitely yeah. wasn't, uh, and it definitely wasn't hard hitting the way the Boondocks was. Yeah, well, it was interesting how a lot of these decisions were made in syndicated comics, where it feels like they were like, okay, we got it, we got to identify a demographic, and then we got to make a comic that's going to appeal to that demographic. Only one comic per demographic. <laughs> uh, that was why Kathy filled the niche for women for so long. Curtis was for the black audience. Women don't need more and, than one comic. Yeah, they don't need one. And I feel like a lot of uh, newspapers were like, well, we're going to get either Curtis or Jumpstart. We're not going to get both. Um, and then you're right. We didn't have Curtis, Curtis in mine. Yeah. Um, I can't think of well, off the top of my head of other comics that specifically targeted, um, you know, uh, um, a- ethnic or, or um, you know, minority groups. No, no, not off really. Top of my head. But I think that was something that came much later because in the eighties, up until the, up until the end of the eighties, uh, the way we kind of looked at this is people were like, okay, there's women, there's blacks, those are the important demographics, no one else counts. Yep. Uh, and then at the very end of the 80s, people started acknowledging that Asians exist. Yeah. Was like, only only East Asians. Yeah, Corporal uh, Yo, but, but you yeah. never saw anyone, you know, this is kind of what they were getting at with the problem with Apu. I mean, it's not that Apu himself in a vacuum is a bad character. It's that he was the only one for so yeah. long. And now well, it's, mm-hmm. now it's, and now being for a lot of people being Indian is, is synonymous with being Apu. When I was, when I first started noticing this sort of stuff, thinking how it was weird, how Americans, um, we didn't ever came to the, the realization that racism is bad it was more that we realized as different racial uh, demographics um, or, uh, or racial groups gain some political clout, that group is no longer safe to make fun of. But it's okay to, to continue making fun of other groups. So yeah. you know, first, you know, uh, blacks and then Asians and then I think uh, Latinos and Indians were totally fine to make fun of until, you know, probably about into the 2000s. Yes. I remember like everyone thought it was hilarious to do Indian accents. Um, Jamaican as well, interestingly, seems to be another one that was totally, uh, totally cool to make fun of until fairly recently. Uh, mm, well, I mean, I've, I mean, I can't think of anything that was making fun of Jamaicans. I'm, 
But maybe I'm just not looking a, at them. I mean, well, I can't think of a specific character, but I just know that a lot of well, that's you know, they'd have kind incidental of a roster kind of a problem right there is when you can't have when you can't name a character. So yeah, yeah. Uh, the oh, ooh, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, I, well, I'm sure. Well, um, I, I'm sure that I'm just you know not in, not informed. I'm not looking for it. Yeah. Hopefully, there's some Jamaican characters out there in modern comics nowadays. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of Jamaican characters if I was familiar with Jamaican comics. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That would be... Um, man, I, I wonder what the comic scene is like in Jamaica. Whoa. Yeah. That would actually, now I'm kind of curious. I guess that's something to look into. Um, anyway, sorry, I got off... We, got off we sure did. Here. Um, <laughs> but Kathy... But was, <laughs> yes. Uh, was there anything else that we wanted to talk about with Kathy? With Kathy? Um, um, well, let's see. I mean, there's two more specials. What are they about? Well, uh, one of them is Kathy's Last Resort, where Kathy goes to, uh, like, Paradise. Basically, it's Garfield in Paradise, except ah. it's Kathy. But she doesn't uh, get which... sacrificed to a volcano? No, nothing cool happens. Oh, there's it's another one, shit. Pacific Islanders. We could still do the whole volcano sacrifice thing for years and years and that's years. That's right. That's right. You know, I thought it was interesting in when Garfield goes to Paradise, he's sacrificed there by a, their, their white tribe, I guess. Yeah, it's, like a, it's like a tribe it's of, kind of... It's like specifically a sort of uh, cargo cult based around uh, 50s greaser culture. <laughs> Okay, I, I I haven't watched the Garfield one so I recently, so I'm I'm I, I'll with I'll yeah hold, for now I will hold judgment mm -hmm. because I only I just, just know a saw lot it of so yeah a lot of cartoons do the thing where they're like okay you're going to be sacrificed by you know a, a a native group that's very clearly supposed to be like South Americans or Africans or something yeah but they're a little nervous about doing that so they're like but they're white people yeah it's like okay that's Ah. I don't know. It, I don't know. It's it's a it's a it's a thing. Yeah. Um, and I it's it's the whole. Well, let's just say that the whole sacrifice by native thing is a very problematic trope. Yes. No matter how you slice it. Right up there <laughs> with being boiled in a big cannibal kettle. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, thanks a lot, New Yorker. Um, <laughs> Replace all those where you're just with the uh, cartoons where you're just sitting on a little sandbar with a single palm tree. <laughs> I, I think those are fine, right? Yes, That's all yes. good. Anyway, so, uh, but back to Kathy. Um, yeah, there are two other Kathy specials. Uh, one is where she goes to paradise, goes to her last resort, and another where, um, uh, I totally forget, something else must happen to her. I, I don't know. Well, what would happen in your ideal Kathy special? Well, obvious. Oh, pff, uh, well, <laughs> it's so, maybe suddenly, I shouldn't this, ask. <laughs> this is going to turn into suddenly it's going to turn into when they ask like Waldorf and Statler, how would you run them up a show? Well, <laughs> <laughs> like two terrific two girls. OK, that's boring. <laughs> yeah, it'll be like two terrific girls. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it'll be like, well, clearly uh, it would be just an hour of her eating donuts out of that burlap sack. Um <laughs> I have to say, like, on a personal note, <laughs> Kathy, uh, gets Kathy, Kathy is something that, like, um, Kathy's diet strips should appeal to me a lot for prurient reasons, because mm -hmm. I, I like that sort of thing. That's that's my jam. Mm -hmm. But Kathy never does it right. No. I'm like, God, Kathy, you know, if you're just, you have all the, like, uh, fat shaming that would be super hot if, <laughs> I mean, not to, not to be mean, but... Kathy Jezizowicz is not that good an artist. Mm. Um, I mean, she's fine for doing a comic strip. You don't need to be a great artist. You just have to get the, you have to be an expressive one. And her work is good for that. Yes. What I'm saying is I can't jerk off to it. <laughs> well, I would say <laughs> but, that know. one of the whole, kind of the, the subtle joke behind Kathy's uh, worries about her weight is that she's not freaking fat. She just thinks she is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which you know, I mean, it could you know, could be hot too because you know, these, I, I really, she really isn't fat. She's pretty normal. Yes. Um, in fact, but, I don't know, think there are any fat people in the strip. Not really. Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, I guess it. Well, when you think about it, uh, they're all fat by society standards. Uh -huh. Unrealistic uh, body image is a real problem, mm -hmm. uh, especially for women. And Kathy uh, is tackling that head on. So. Good on Kathy. Um, we have, but yeah, that would be my ideal <laughs> thing. It should be much more about Kathy going to gym, not going to the gym and failing at aerobics and being sad and going and eating donuts afterwards and acting about it. 
So yeah, that would be my thing. Also, uh, obviously, no, and and it would end probably my ideal Kathy special. Irving comes in is like Kathy, uh, you're fat. Well, I don't like that. Blah. And Kathy will be like, you know what, Irving, I don't need you. I am better than you. Get out of my house. I don't need a man to be happy, and I especially don't need you. So, uh, in that, then, then that automatically the best one. You know, just yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Is there anything that you would uh, you would change if uh, you ran the Kathy? If I ran Kathy, uh, let's see, Kath. Let's see. I would want to focus on her and her friends. I would, I would like to see what they do outside of a work context and outside of a men context because there really isn't that much else going on for them. I want to see the kind of, you know. Okay, my my Kathy strip would be about her accepting that she's going to be single forever, and then going to all these, you know, going to do all the fun things that you would never have done. Basically. Doing all the things that would get Irving to be really interested in her and <laughs> not be and be like, oh, wow, Kathy, I didn't know you liked racquetball. I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> but so maybe that, you know, maybe it's not as self-serving, but uh, I would. <laughs> but I would definitely want to see something about, you know, Kathy discovering herself. Huh. I think that would actually be that would be good. And like Kathy like gets said, a life. Was, yeah. If. Oh, even had a title. You know, if Kathy was as a comic book rather than a comic strip, uh, she could really explore these themes. And I think that would, yeah, I think, you know, you got me thinking. I really think you're right. This Kathy would have been a lot better served as a comic book. Yeah, because I think that it's fun. It's better if there isn't the pressure to have a joke every four panels, especially because Kathy jokes generally sort of follow that. Follow that BC thing where she just defines a word at the end of it. Kathy works herself into a tizzy over Oreos or whatever, and then finally says, Oreos, the solution to li all of life's problems. Yeah, or it'll be something like mom, a three-letter <laughs> word for guilt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so anyway. Um, so. <laughs> now I'm imagining Peter f or BC just stepping on a rock that says Kathy, and it uh, dis dispenses a Kathy strip. <laughs> <laughs> then they just throw it in the ocean. It goes across. <laughs> the next day, another one floats back, and it's like it just says "ack." <laughs> <sighs> okay, so so that is that is our critical reassessment of Kathy. Yes. Um, Thank you for joining us for our special presentation. But oh, I can't do yeah. the thing. We'll just we'll just edit it in here. Stay tuned for Mr. Belvedere. <laughs> <laughs> and amazing stories. It's animated this week. Oh, family dog. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Oh, that's another thing. <laughs> All right. I think we're uh, put it ready. Put this in the in the bag. Yeah. Let's put it in the can. Yeah. All right. That's right. Can. All right. And oh, should we should we should we say anything about it? Other places people can see us. So, Mike, where can people see more of your work? Okay, so if you ha don't already know, visit www.guttersnipecomic.com for more uh, text games, uh, hilariousness, and of course, comics, which is the sort of thing we're talking about right here. Or we love comics, and yeah. it shows. Yes, exactly. And Ethan, where, uh, where are you on the internet these days? You can find me at thehungryreader.com, where you can see my vi videos where I dissect Oz books and many other beloved children's stories. And also, while you're while you're looking at my stuff, be sure to check out my my amazing new novel, Joy Traveler, which is available at the link below at bogleach.com. All right, and we're signing off. Yep. Oh, let's not forget we have to uh, threaten people who don't. Uh... Oh yeah, please like, subscribe, all that stuff. Um, yes, listen to our stuff, and and if you're not uh, paying our and if you're not paying our dues, we will continue to uh, slander you. For example, ExpressVPN they will they will uh, turn your computer into a Bitcoin mine. Oh, I don't like that. <laughs> I like that. A, I, I that's the opposite of what I want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and good night, everybody. Good night. Ack!